real quick, what is the actual definition for biosimilance? Oh wow! You know that that's that's that you just that you jumped right into something that's um, almost undefined right now. The biostimulant market is increasing by 10, 20 percent every year, and and I would expect it to increase significantly in the next few years because we're having all these supply chain issues with fertilizers, right? But a lot of these seaweeds, um, whether it's kelp or other algae, they they have a lot of what's listed right here. We've got a lot of phytohormones. You'll also find a lot of the alginates in seaweeds, polyamines, and, and, and a lot of those trace minerals. So um, you'll find all that in seaweed. All that in seaweed, yeah. And, wow. And, and, Plant extracts are biostimulants. You're here with Av Sai and Mark Batwell on Perfect Gardens TV. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and also check us out on our Facebook and Instagram. And if you haven't already hit the notifications, please go ahead and do so. Let's go ahead and get into it. Make sure to check out our monthly membership. For as little as $2.99 a month, you get access now to 105 members, 2,586 photos, 274 videos, 21 files, 1,106 shared links, and much, much more. Okay, guys, so we're just getting started with part one on biostimulants, and we actually decided to break this up into a three parts on biostimulants because technically you can classify biostimulants into five separate parts, uh, but I think that we will be able to cover the majority of them in part one, two, and three, and we, just, uh, we asked uh, Av to come back on the channel. He's one of the leading agronomists and soy biologists in uh, Canada. Uh, leading the charge for our can of plants. And I wanted to just go ahead and start off with the first slide for biostimulants. So real quick, what is the actual definition for biostimulants? Oh, wow. You know, that, that's, that's, that you just, that you jumped right into something that's um, almost undefined right now. Yeah. We've been uh, looking at biostimulants for well over a hundred years. The, the term is, is, is more recent than that, but Every country is trying to define it and, and come to a better def definition of it as, as more people understand what biostimulants are. To me, the best way of describing a biostimulant is, is to move it away from calling it a fertilizer because in, in large practice, you are using minute amounts of this product and seeing a larger response, right? So if we think of fertilizers and, and mainly, you know, you're going to have your macronutrients and then you've got your micronutrients, or if we treat all of the fertilizers as the essential nutrients a plant has, biostimulants would be any product, uh, often described as any naturally occurring product, but there are now synthetic biostimulants and or microorganism that will promote either plant growth, quality of the product, or the immune response of that, the plant. Do you think that it's because of the claims that companies have to make, like for instance, like if we're talking about chitin, then it could fall potentially under pesticides. And then if they go into pesticides, then it, that goes into a whole different type of regulatory processes in which the companies have to do. Do you, So do you think there's a little bit of restrictions on that? And that's why the definition is not clear because science shows us one thing, but then how we have to regulate it and they say another thing, or what do you think about that? And I think, um, you know, I know that in Europe, they uh, almost every year they're now starting to have a biostimulant con conference. A lot of it is to try to help better define what biostimulants are, and and they're looking at uh, what is now including it, uh, included as a biostimulant, moving beyond just the naturally occurring ones to now having some synthetic ones. Canada and the U.S. are now allowing that word. You're starting to see the word biostimulant being used. Some of the things that we used to call fertilizers are now being reclassified as biostimulants. And, and uh, I think there'll be the next five years, we'll have a, a definitely a, an upsurge of biostimulants. I mean, the biostimulant market is increasing by 10, 20% every year. And, and I would expect it to increase significantly in the next few years because we're having all these supply chain issues with fertilizers, right? Yeah. So larger scale growers are having a harder time finding their nitrogen sources or their sulfur sources or their phosphorus sources are going to be turning towards these biostimulants where you're seeing, you know, minute, minute doses creating a, a huge response. 
Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's always like an afterthought for some reason. Like we always are focusing on MPK, nitrogen, calcium, everything. And then you have biostimulants over there. And once people know about them, man, do, you know, we talk about them, we blast them out there because of the benefits, you know, with drought resistance, the, the amount of water retention. And there, there's so many good things. And I always felt like biostimulants should, should be up front as equally as important with those fertilizers. As you stated, if certain things are being restricted and coming to, through the flow of distribution through different countries, then if we can use less fertilizer and create the same results, if not better yields because of these stimulants, then we're, a lot of people are missing out on a lot of things. I think it's it's kind of important to always, you know, just much like in Canada, you got to give thanks and praise to the prohibition of growers and, and the legacy growers and, and, and that whole subculture that uh, mm-hmm. brought forth this information. Biostimulants are things that traditional farmers have been using for over 100 years and, of course, dating back, you know, thousands of years. So it's just a new word on some common knowledge. So let's dive into one of these each at a time and help us kind of understand better why these are considered biostimulants for plant extracts. Uh, first one being seaweed. Why is that considered to be a biostimulant? I think when we look at, at biostimulants as a whole, we, we do classify them in, in, in kind of these categories Arguably, seaweed extracts, seaweeds. Um, I noticed that kelp is written there too. Yeah, so, same thing. Uh, yeah, and and I mean, although they have very you know distinct in when we think of kelp, we often speak of of like a, a Norwegian kelp or brown kelp, uh, the Ascophyllum nodosum, that species. But kelp is a is, is a much b- bigger classification. And so some of the uh, interesting uh, work recently has been happening on. Echolonia maxima, um, some of the uh, the sea bamboo, but a lot of these seaweeds, um, whether it's kelp or other algae, they they have a lot of what's listed right here. We've got a lot of phytohormones, so the phytohormones predominantly are, are the class of auxins, cytokinins, uh, some of the uh, gib- gibberellins or gibberellic acid. You'll also find a lot of the alginates in seaweeds, polyamines. Uh, you will find, uh, of course, B vitamins. And, and, and a lot of those trace minerals. So um, you'll find all that in seaweed. All that in seaweed, yeah. And, wow. And, 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 and of course, um, it, it, some of it has to do with the way it's being processed. So right. there's certain ones that are going to have, you know, a, a, a more of a particular amount of the phytohormones or B vitamins or the trace minerals, depending on on the processing. But when we look at that, the generic topic of, of plant extracts, uh, yeah, they come with all of that. You know, the polyamines uh, being sort of precursors to uh, uh, some of the amino acids. To me, what's interesting is that maybe 20 years ago, we would have just called them seaweed extracts. We didn't know everything that was in them. And as the biostimulant movement gets a little bit more mainstream, you get scientists who are trying to really pinpoint what all of the magic is happening, right? We, we used to use biostimulants because of the magic. And we had may not have known exactly what was happening, didn't care what was happening. We saw the results. We saw that the plant looked healthier, the plant was able to respond to, to other stresses and live through those stresses. And now as science is accepting this and we're starting to see all those benefits that Dave was referring to, they're starting to pinpoint, oh, you know, what's happening there is it's a polyamine that's doing this, or it's a, you know, a particular B vitamin that's helping that. Yeah. So out of the whole, out of everything you mentioned, the only three you probably, I don't think you mentioned that is basically in seaweed is yucca, brassin and steroids, I think you didn't mention, and the the second to last one. Actually, um, and, and most plants would all have those as well, right? So, I mean, yucca is its its own unique uh, plant extract, but uh, you'll find brassin and steroids in seaweeds, but you'll find brassin and steroids in, in most plants. Hmm. Um, it, it, it's, another, it's another phytohormone. It, I think it was first identified in probably like rape or canola. And that's why it has the name Brassa, you know, like Brassica, but it's, it's just another hormone. And uh, Florotannins um, I think are, are quite common in, in brown, uh, brown algae and brown seaweed. So and, and that's, that's why I think, you know, if you're on a, if, if you had a desert Island pick of which, uh, which biostimulant you would want, um, you know, seaweed and kelp extracts are right up there. Hmm. 
Yeah, we, we, we had our video with down to earth uh, kelp and going over, you know, that it has auctions and stuff. And a, and a lot of these companies, like I said before, they're, they're not going to put on the box that contains like they're not going to make these statements. So it's really important to to, to start going down these lists, familiarizing yourselves and then and then doing some research and then finding the products and, and biostimulants that are good to provide what you are looking for uh, in terms of, of health growth or, you know, for with your biostimulants. A lot of these that don't, they don't state it, but they have it. You know, we have very specific bios stimulant products now in the market. They're kind of stating it, but then there's also other products like, like we discussed in previous videos about kelp, you know, and they're not going to say that. So if, if you make yourself aware of what's within these products, you might be getting a lot more or missing out on some vice versa if, if you don't know. So to just dive in a little deeper, uh, obviously seaweeds, the best picks. Everyone knows that. If you want to stop watching, you could do that here now. But but what does auxins and what do these do specifically within the planet? Dave, you had a, a interesting way of describing these. Will you describe that to us well, again? As I go through my journey and, and learn myself more, um, auxins, I, I found uh, John Kempf kind of explained it in a way to think of auxins as maybe more of the, the male hormone driven and then cytokines is more of the female. So auxins are related to, to the, that vertical stretching, that growth, the internodal spacings. And, and they're both present in the plant. Like I've said, um, it's what, which one is more dominant over the other. So what, what is the plant? What is the process the plant is, is in vegetation flower and what one is going to become more dominant or other. And I was discussing with you guys, I'm like, man, so if we're in, let's say week three or four of flower, if we're providing products with lots of auxins potential or to stimulate the plant to create more auxins, I'm sorry, are we creating longer internode spacings? And sometimes people think it might be the light. Mm, yeah. I, I think it's, you know, one of the, the most important things when we talk about biostimulants is the dosing. Uh, timing yeah. of dosing is important as well, but but it, it's it's making sure that you're not putting a lot on. If you put too much uh, of a kelp extract on during flower, there there's a uh, yeah there's going to be a lot of pressure on, and there's going to be a lot of gibberlins. Those gibberlins may may stimulate uh, floral production. You may in fact increase the uh, potential of, of hermaphrodism. Right? right. So you want to be careful that you're not spraying too often, and less is more. You find that it is a it's a stimulant. So a little bit gives you a big, big result. Yeah. Um, if you're using so, a balanced uh, kelp extract where you're, you're going to have both auxins and cytokinins, you can induce a bit of stretch, but at the same time, the cytokinins are, you know, they're fighting to right. have a little bit more lateral growth. Yeah. Um, where the auxins can prom promote more vertical growth. It just put things in perspective. I kind of looked at it. I'm like, okay, I'm a male, so I'm dominant uh, testosterone, but we have estrogen. But then if I took a lot of estrogen, then obviously I'm going to start getting different traits, you know? So I, I was kind of making those connections, you know, from my, myself, the hormones that are within my body, how they could affect me, my growth and so forth. And then looking at, you know, uh, auxin, cytokines and stuff like that, and kind of viewing it in that form. So is this the reason why, have you ever heard of the product Cannaboost? Cannaboost, yeah. yeah. That one is a biostimulant. It says it right there on the label. Uh, they recommend to only put it at the end of flowering. And I had a client that wanted to put it in in the first weekend of flowering. And I'm guessing this is probably because it has one of the, uh, the biostimulants that induces ripening or flowering. And they put it in now, it, it could cause a, a negative experience in the crop. Is that is that correct? I, th I think we'll, we'll notice that with a lot of biostimulants, um, that improper timing or excessive use of it will give you adverse effects. Sometimes absolutely, uh, um, you know, death, you know, when, when we talk about later wow. on, or in some of these uh, organic acids, for example, you know, citric acid, uh, acetic acid, you know, those are some of the organic acids that, that we use as biostimulants. And, um, you know, you, you spray too much acetic acid on, um, and typically you would use acetic acid, a very minute amount of acetic acid, which is, you know, essentially vinegar, you can help improve drought stress, right? But if you use a lot of acetic acid, of, of course, you can affect uh, the pH of, of, the, of the soil. And, you know, it is a herbicide as well. So it can, it can really kill your plant. Sure. Um, and, um, and, yeah, I think with Cannaboost, I think that was probably it. If you started spraying it too often, and, and too much, it's way too much potassium. And that, that, that amount of potassium will, one, it'll shift your nitrogen to potassium ratio significantly. 
uh, which will affect your BRICS levels. And then you can also, of course, create a situation where you will have some hermaphrodism happening because you've stimulated a, a particular pathway, signaling a pathway to, to produce uh, the male uh, anther. All right. So why is yucca uh, so different? I mean, it's always being sold. A lot of people tell me that it's just, it's a great use right there initially, but it washes out of the soil really quickly. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Why is it considered to be a biostimulant? Um, yeah. So, so I think, I think you kind of nailed some of the, uh, the real attributes of, of yucca extract. You know, we use it as a wetting agent, uh, pre- predominantly as organic growers. If you're looking for a wetting agent for your soil, yucca extract seems to work incredibly well. And, and yucca, um, much like uh, things like coconut and, and aloe vera as well, they, they all have uh, something called saponins. And, and those saponins are essentially what gives soap its, um, you know, bubbly uh, nature to it. It helps break the, the surface tension of, of a water molecule, right? So instead of a water molecule kind of holding its shape, it, it just makes it a little bit thinner and more malleable. So when you water your soil, you don't have it all sort of turning hydrophobic. It, it takes in that water. And that's really important because a lot of people use like heavy concentrations of, of peat moss and peat moss, man, when you dry that out, whew, yeah. Like you go to, you go to add water back into that. You, you better have a product like, you know, that has yucca to break, like you said, to break that surface tension, to, to suspend those minerals and stuff again and, and make them available. And, you know, I was reading an article once about uh, like they had soil, it was bone dry, you know, and, but they're like, no, this still holds 70% of its ultimate water capacity. It's just it, the water tension and the bonds to the clay and stuff. It can't be released. And I, I'm just like, what? <laughs> like it really 70%, but it looks like it's dusty and dry. It's, you know, so these are products. If, if you know, if you're like, you're saying going cocoa, especially peat moss, HP pro mix, that's like 70, 80% peat moss. And if you get in these situations where you unfortunately dry out the soil too much, this is going to be the way to, to ensure proper saturation of that soil. Again, the re the rehydration, you know, and sometimes you'll, you'll, uh, you'll create situations where you get uh, a nutrient lockout or a salt buildup. That's another good way of using yucca. Um, yeah. it, it'll kind of flesh that out. Now, in terms of actually being a biostimulant, I mean, one of the, one of the other things that, it, that yucca has is it does have salicylic acid. Right, so salicylic acid, much like what you have in willow extract powder or aloe vera powder, that salicylic acid will trigger an immune response within the plant. Right, and so so you will trigger the systemic acquired resistance within that plant. You may have heard of it as you know SAR or SAR elicitor. That's another way that yucca can be considered a biostimulant. Typically, when you trigger that salicylic acid pathway or the SAR. Um, uh, immune immune response, you're, you're getting the plant to a heightened level of immunity. And that will often mean that it's going to trigger to the product, changing some of your primary metabolites into secondary metabolites. And so that's mm-hmm. why cannabis users often would like to use uh, sour elicitors to heighten the immune response of the plant. So your so w- the willow and aloe could be also considered a biostimulants as well. Yes, uh, I think this is a very generic, uh, you know, uh, plant yeah. extracts. Now we, I mean, there's, because it's traditional knowledge, right? This is a lot of this is traditional knowledge. In, in parts of Africa, they use a maize green extract, right? So you just take mm-hmm. uh, corn leaves and, and you make an extract out of those corn leaves. Um, that's an amazing biostimulant. And most of these biostimulants will be triggering that immune response of the plant, or it'll help signal uh, a particular uh, immune response or signal nutrient uptake. And they have many redundant methods, right? So, so one thing can do a whole bunch of these um, responses. Hmm. Mike, you had a question. So I'm listening to all this. And I've do you think people are going to be causing a lot of deficiencies with these stimulants, not knowing when to use them and that? Cause, and is it going to outweigh the practicality of this? Like, it's, it, like it, it's, it, it's, if they start dumping this on the market and they start advertising it and, and, and people are start jumping on all of this, are we going to start happening to do deficiency videos on the stimulants? Yeah, so it, it is. it is important to distinguish that these are not typically what we consider fertilizers. 
So you still need to have the NPK and, and your calcium, your sulfur, your magnesium, and so on. Now, arguably, some of the trace minerals are now being considered biostimulants because they are not considered essential nutrients, and therefore they're not typically considered fertilizers. But those trace minerals that you, of course, find in, in a lot of these uh, extracts, there's a lot of trace minerals, kelp, uh, for example, those trace minerals will trigger it. So you still have to maintain the fertility, but you can reduce the amount of fertility because instead of having much of your nitrogen just sit there and not become available to the plant or not be able to be taken up by the plant, many of these, you know, for example, some of the polyamines, polyamines will help open up certain channels within the cell wall of, 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 of our growing root. And so now it has greater chance to take up some of those nutrients that are present, but just not being taken up because of some of the limitations around the, the, the root. So stimulants will never replace fertilizers. Then. It will just help us reduce our, the amount of fertilizer that we're using. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, when we get on to talking about microbials, of course, a lot of what we see here are uh, biostimulants in the, in the direct form because they're actually going to stimulate microbial response. You know, we often will give a lot of credit to kelp as being the source of a lot of cytokinins, but in fact, it's the bacillus subtilis uh, in association with, you know, so it's a microbe in association with uh, the kelp that it will increase cytokine hmm. production. Is That's that, a good is fact. It, That's a that mind kelp? map right there. <laughs> is that um no I, that's it is is that so is that the bacteria that lives on the surface of seaweed already no uh that i mean there could be bacillus species on on seaweed I, i'm not familiar with that uh, well enough but you know, found in like great white and i think recharge has bacillus i think as well yeah and, and of course it's a very specific strain of bacillus uh, mm -hmm. you know bacillus subtilis uh, that does this but you know one of the reasons why we like having a nice living soil with bacillus subtilis is that you will get you know a much greater root mass because that's what cytokinins are right cytokinins are going to help you know explode cell growth right and so right. And that's what bacillus is doing in, in combination with kelp. So kelp's almost a biostimulant for the bacillus subtilis to produce more uh, cytokinins. And then the roots, you have increased roots. One thing I find kind of interesting is that a lot of growers in the industry will use just a one-off bacteria, one-off fungi, like uh, Globus interatus and it's extreme gardening, or they'll use the azos, which is again, a single bacteria. And if they use those products with seaweed, they're really not getting the soil microbial going as good as they could, as they could get if they, they found the specific bacteria that you just mentioned, correct? I just want to add on something while we're listening. Is anybody wants to get a little deeper into this? I uh, just look at our videos that we did with Ab on our teas, and I got really deep into that whole subject. So we can tie it into uh, this. Yeah, cool. I you know I I think it's um it's uh, it's always hard, and I think we did yeah we did talk a little bit about you know do you want to hit the specific one or do you want to use a consortia you know like add a whole bunch of microbes and both seem to work right? It, it's for different purposes. And I, when we want legumes to nodulate, for the most part, we're going to use one specific microbe. It's going to be a rhizobia species that we're going to use. But, you know, if, if we're looking to, the, you know, have a really good vascular uh, growth of, of mycorrhizae, then of course, we, yeah, we're going to use a, a rhizophagus enterodices and stuff like that. So. Of, uh, if you, I don't know if you guys have any other questions, but this I think was a great first start into part one into biostimulants and plant extract. Guys, it, please go on and follow us along to part two and three as we cover amino acids and carbon sources and how they are connected to biostimulants. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe only on Perfect Garden TV. Uh, let's get into it. What is pit moss? It is a recycled newspaper product that you can plant your plants in that's ripped down, shredded up, remolded into like little teeny puff balls and cellulose fibers all just sticking out all over it. Hold moisture, microbes, nutrients, keeps everything from washing away, 